children and unwashed, your house as you left it, your hunger forgotten, wondering as you came to a stop, what had occupied your thoughts since leaving work? You wouldn't have felt the need to wash in the red pan in the cold back kitchen, scrubbing to your elbows, futilely trying to erase the oil grease on your palm, pushing water on your face, blowing out loudly, scrubbing down to your breast bone, leaving your neck red mottled with effort. You wouldn't have sat at the bottom of the oblong table, waiting for your dinner to be placed, or looking between the rows of your children at your wife sitting at the opposite end. One word, chef. <laughs> or she wouldn't have risen without pause and passed your seat to retrieve the brown sauce you demanded, days when dinner wasn't up to much. If I was your wife, I would have answered bollocks <laughs> to your chef and told you, get off your arse and get it yourself. <laughs> but we would never have reached the table. We would have eaten from the earth, raw mud-covered spuds and carrots, laughed as the nettles stung our mouths, made love in the tall grass. The chil your children unwashed, your house as you left it, your hunger forgotten, wondering as you came to a stop, what had occupied your thoughts since leaving work? You wouldn't have felt the need to wash in the red pan in the cold back kitchen, scrubbing to your elbows, futilely trying to erase the oil grease on your palm, pushing water on your face, blowing out loudly, scrubbing down to your breast bone, leaving your neck red mottled with effort. You wouldn't have sat at the bottom of the oblong table, waiting for your dinner to be placed, or looking between the rows of your children at your wife sitting at the opposite end. One word, chef. <laughs> or she wouldn't have risen without pause and passed your seat to retrieve the brown sauce you demanded, days when dinner wasn't up to much. If I was your wife, I would have answered bollocks <laughs> to your chef and told you, get off your arse and get it yourself. <laughs> but we would never have reached the table. We would have eaten from the earth, raw mud-covered spuds and carrots, laughed as the nettles stung our mouths, made love in the tall grass. The I don't wish to nitpick. <laughs> But I'm going to take sides in the was were argument, as in if I was your wife against if I were your wife. In my opinion, was here is an incorrect usage and it does violence to the English language. Was, you see, you pay attention, Peter. Was is past tense. It should be were. Where is the subjunctive mood, which is typically used to express various states of unreality, such as wish or emotion or possibility, or action which has not yet occurred. And I would give a couple of references. Beyonce, is that how you say it? Beyonce <laughs> yes, had a song called, If I Were a Boy. And Gladys Knight in the Bad Scenes had one called, If I Were Your Woman. By the way, Peter, if you was my wife, <laughs> I don't care how bored you were, I'd still advise against painting nettles in the nude. <laughs> and by the way, Peter, how does a solicitor sleep? First he lies on one side, then he lies on the other. <laughs> the best piece of the night. <laughs> and I mean that most genuinely. I think this is a poem that the author should be extremely proud of. It's a fierce and angry poem. It reminds me of Dylan Thomas writing about raging against the dying of the light. Here is a woman raging against boredom and staleness in her marriage and fighting to keep her life interesting. It's like the, it's a short poem, 
It reminds me of the little competition which you see every Saturday and Sunday or the Saturday Independent for six uh, short story in six words. And this encapsulates an entire life in this short poem. And as for Michael's nitpicking, well, I know he, I knew immediately that he wouldn't pick it because it doesn't rhyme. Uh, and just to tell him that language is a living thing. Uh, and slagging off this poem that was or were is like slagging off Dylan Thomas for talking about the man in the wind and the west moon in the great lines. So uh, I'm afraid Michael would have to come into the, I suppose he into the 20th century would be a start, and then he might have been into the 21st. <laughs> because of the strong whisper images and it's not it does bring us on an emotional journey from the first if I was your wife to the very last one they hold very different ways and it begins in a playful antagonistic voice and the startling image of a naked woman in a yard painting nettles um, it's a reverent and self-aware but it, that's not enough in a poem so it's not just that it's more emotionally complex I found the next image the, the image of you the man trying to wash oil from his hands um, brings it above something that's a tirade, even a painful one. There's a fierce empathy for that man in the cold back kitchen, his neck mottled with effort. So it, everything is down to interpretation, and this is, this is how I read it. But it's fresh and it's celebration of Freya, embracing every flow of my being, and that final, if I was your wife. That last line holds so much more weight, and it's very different in tone from the initial, <coughs> if I was your wife, of the title. I thought it was a very strong, playful and original poem, but it runs deep too, so that's why that made it. Waiting for John. I spend much time waiting for John, in train stations, under bus shelters, on park benches, waiting for his train to come, for his bus to arrive, for him to appear. When I think he might not turn up, my stomach tightens, my heart pitter pats. When I am not waiting for John, I am working on the fifth floor of an architect's office, swiveling on a high chair at a drawing board, next to the smutty window that overlooks a round. I fear I will end up as charred remains, my body buried in a collapsed tunnel under some London street. I will be excavated. I will be identified by my identity records. The records that are filed in the drawer of the yellow dented steel cabinet in a room on the second floor of the health board building in Corn Market where there is always a heavy smell of hops and yeast blowing in from St. James's Gate. John is already 25 minutes late. I look ahead. I see him walking towards me. I am waving. He is walking faster. Then he is kissing me, giving me a long, slim parcel wrapped in turquoise paper. Inside, I will find a new watch with a blue moon face freckled with tiny gold stars. As far as I can see, this is just an attempt to piggyback on the success of Brian Friedel's great play, Waiting for Goggle. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work. It's completely spoiled by the fact that John actually arrived. <laughs> Such characters should never arrive. As Kevin Kilban said earlier, it's better to travel hopefully. And the other problem is the character of John. John! John! Who the hell is John? And why is she waiting for him? Time seems to be the real issue here. When John finally arrives, you'll notice he brings her a watch. Now, if she had a watch from the very start, <laughs> she would have known when he was arriving. <laughs> and she'd have saved herself all the heartbreak of waiting and saved us all the reading. And just to confuse things then, near the end, there's another character introduced. Frankie. Frankie? Who the hell is Frankie? And why did he or she go to Hollywood? I feel there's a sequel coming on, waiting for Frankie. <laughs> Michael is going back further and further in time. I just to tell him Frankie were a well-known band in the 1980s or early 1990s. You might have begun to remind me at this stage of the judge in the famous case in London in the 1960s, late 1960s, and some mention was made of the Beatles. Who are the Beatles? They're a jazz combination, my lord, was the answer. Um, <laughs> I mean, 
the lawyer involved didn't know much either. I, I have to say, I think this is a lovely piece of writing. It reminds me, for some reason, which I can't understand, of Sebastian Barry's writing, the sort of dreamy quality to the writing, and the way it flits from Dublin to London and back again, and from 1984, perhaps much later. Uh, the obsession with John, which appears in the early part of it, reminds me of Stendhal. A Stendhal was a French writer, Michael. <laughs> um, so it's the, this is the acorn of a novel. I think the sorry, I think the very start of a novel is a story. I agree with Michael. I do want to know who John was. I do not want to know what the relationship was. Uh, I think there's enough there to get me interested, and I'd like to do the rest of it. For this piece, it just caught me on the first line. It held me to the last. It's with a combination of the language and the tone and the quiet rhythm. I found it word perfect and close to poetry in the exactness of each line length, each pause and each full stop. Um, it doesn't spoon feed us a story, it gives us the images, the emotions and the memories and allows us to piece it together for ourselves. Um, once I began this story I forgot I was reading. The flow of the narration, the images and the moving back and forth in time are seamless. So much is fitted into a sentence, for example the narrator's job. Um, swiveling on a high chair at a drawing board next to the smutty window that overlooks a roundabout. It's one sentence and you have a whole world filled in for you. I think it's technically it's very accomplished because it moves so easily. We're told the narrator's terror of ending up as charred remains in a collapsed underground tunnel. And with each paragraph we move from the narrator's thoughts to moments from her life um, to the now where she's always waiting for John and the fear, to the fear she has to a childhood memory of theft and arriving in London as a young woman and she stopped wearing white because the sooty dust that swirls through the tunnels. And I just thought it was the most beautiful sentence in it as well. There are many good sentences, but the, where she describes the dust that is flakes of old skin, my skin, your skin, the skin of millions, the skin of generations. I just thought it was a very beautiful piece of work. But our father Menelaus was not convinced of my suitability and bade me Skype him. A courtier informed me that my call may be recorded for training and monitoring purposes. <laughs> you must prove the worth of your hand for my daughter, he said. In Circa, at the edge of the known world, lies a treasure coveted by all the kings of Greece. Find this place, face its custodian, and return to me with the golden hoodie. <laughs> Only then may you possess my daughter as your wife. Before we left, I went to see the oracle at Delphi. She told me that according to recent studies, broccoli causes cancer. <laughs> and beware the carbohydrates of white bread. <clears throat> Looking into the foaming pool in the temple, she told me that the gods advise a diet of rashers and board seed. Telemachus, who was the resident expert for the sky coverage, gave the signal from the studio and we slipped into the, from the harbour into the crystal blue waters of the Aegean. Many of the Argonauts posted on Twitter that they were really glad to be underway and I updated the Facebook status of our voyage to really excited. <laughs> Friends commented that they liked this. <laughs> Zeus sent winds to help us on our way and we sped into the ocean so fast that the CNN helicopter could barely keep pace. An army of cyclops assembled and by the dying embers of our beach fire we kept them at bay until daybreak when they retreated with the bodies of their fallen comrades. When celebrating our victory I was summoned to a conference call with the almighty sponsors of our expedition, an oil multinational. Their public relations officer told me that the gods were not pleased by our aggressive actions. <clears throat> it might jeopardise the sponsors' quest for drilling rights in cyclops waters. <laughs> A press conference was called and I announced to the cameras and human rights protesters that a fund was to be set up for the education and protection of disadvantaged cyclops. <laughs> As Michael uh, showed that piece, I have to go first. And uh, I'm reminded of Michael's reference to the Brazilian football player earlier on. Uh, and to our very esteemed um, panel on RTE, and thank you for watching the World Cup. Um, as they say in life, that there are three types of people. There are those who can, and they do. Those who can't do, teach. And those who can't teach, criticize. <laughs> um, uh, if you take, for example, uh, in, in football, I suppose Messi plays, he can do it. 
John Giles would be a good teacher. He teaches and Eamon Dunphy criticizes. Mm -hmm. So adopting a line from Eamon Dunphy, I'm going to have to simply say, that was a good piece, not a great piece. <laughs> um, I, I would love if I could write that as well, I should say. Uh, and I look forward to the day when I can. Uh, but uh, on this day, I have to say, Michael, that you will not be able to repeat your line that this is definitely the best piece of writing. <laughs> <laughs> this mark is a great piece. It's a worthy successor to the great landmarks of literary moder modernism. Joyce's Finnegan's Way, <coughs> Eliot's The Wasted Land, Moore's Walking the Streets in the Rain, <laughs> and Bruce's If Tomorrow Never Comes. <laughs> like those works, Mark deconstructs our understanding of time by collapsing past, present, and future into a gloriously grotesque account of the instability and alienation of modern life. Do you want me to repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> like the hero in the story, we are the one-eyed people, continually fighting against changing food fads, diet advice, the intrusion of social media, the secret location of Ryanair's airports. <laughs> and then when we finally reach the goal, we find emptiness. No money left, the pension fund empty, our free travel threatened. The golden hoodie has been clogged. And speaking of a tale to tell, I once went to a solicitor and I said, if I gave you 500 euro, would you answer two important questions? And he said, of course I would. What's the second question? I'd like to reply before our adjudicator comes in to say that this is a battle of the book tonight. And it did strike me earlier on that perhaps myself and Michael needed uh, different identities for this. Uh, and on that basis, uh, when all who fails, I usually go to Sky, uh, Star Wars for inspiration, and I decided that tonight that I would be Luke Highlighter. <laughs> <laughs> and considering that it needs a villain as well, though I have to, and because of concerning books, it has to be the one and only Dark Books. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a no rush to show itself, which is a sign of confidence and restraint. Um, the writer waits until the end of the first paragraph after telling us about the hero's renown and cross briefs and analysis fairs before dropping in the mention of Sky. It takes a lot of restraint to do that. Um, and the golden hoodie is just such a woody idea of all the contemporary clothing to pick. The hoodie is just, you <laughs> couldn't do any better for that. Um, the writer just builds and builds all of these contemporary references into a hero's voice until it becomes hilariously absurd with the men sacrificing this to their psychic patient before the high priest of health and safety, and setting up a fund for a disadvantaged cyclops, buying the golden hoodie, sold to cash for gold. Nothing in this piece was obvious, or on it, or expected, and the writing was brilliant and assured. It's fantastic. <laughs>